morning. My name is Aaron Shaw. I'm a third year intern at Hope Crew LDI, uh, going into my last year. And I have the privilege of being able to talk about the Great Awakening, or the Great Awakening that happened sort of in the 16 to 1800s in America. And the way that I wanted to do it is I wanted to set it up kind of in three ways, three points. If you're, uh, if you're a type A person, you're like, I just need to know where we're going. Here's where we're going. Three things. The how and the what of the Great Awakening pitfalls of the Great Awakening, and then the ways that the Great Awakening changes our ministry today. And when I was preparing this, I kind of thought, okay, this is really going to be a good talk. I'm excited to talk about this. And I thought a little bit more. I'm like, well, I feel like the church history is just not that exciting, and I don't like it. So how do I make it more exciting? And a church history to me is kind of like this. It's kind of just like fact intuitive. It's like, did you know scuba divers roll backwards off boats because if they rolled forward, they would just go in the boat? That <laughs> way that church history it just seems a little bit too intuitive. It's like, okay, so yeah, we kind of learn some facts, we see what happened, and then we move on. But that's not what I want to do. I don't just want to kind of want you to regurgitate facts or dates or people. I think that that's not necessarily the most helpful thing. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to frame this in the context of basically, while we're kind of going, if you're looking for something to kind of hold on to, it's a bigger theme here. The bigger thing is that I want you to get lost in God's story. I want you to see the way that God actually is the one that orchestrates everything. Oh, I need a microphone, don't I? Yes, congregational was the word that I was giving. Is the microphone on, Sandy? It just connects to the video camera. It's not actually projecting your voice. Is the is that picking it? Yeah. It no, no, it's not. It's not. This on the receiver. Okay, try to speak. Better? Better? It's it's a solid green light on my on me. Channel two. Here and jumping. So we're looking for it. How about now? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now we're good. Awesome. Great. So <clears throat> to reiterate again. I want you to get lost in God's story. I want you to focus on seeing where God is moving and how you're a part of this, too. Because the Great Awakenings were not just kind of a dot in American church history and then nothing, right? It's not a light switch. God doesn't just kind of go, oh, we're just going to do all this awesome stuff and then light switch off. It's not how it works. There's a story that goes along with it. And we're lost in that story. So I want to invite you, as we kind of go through this, think about the story that we're lost in. So... First point, we're going to talk about the how and the what of the Great Awakening. And the way that I think about this is I think about a room. And I think about when you're in a room, there's furniture. And the way that you organize the furniture says a lot about the room and how you want to sit. If you really want to have a good place to put your couch, it's not next to the window. So that way the light always shines in your eyes all the time. That's not where you put a couch. And so I want to be able to furnish the room a little bit of what's kind of going on at the time of the Great Awakening. And to give you a reference, it's happening between the time of 1600 and 1650. That's the time period that we're going to start with as far as um, kind of furnishing the room. So, number one, the Puritan desire for a holy nation. Consider this. From the time of Jesus, about 34 AD, 33 AD, up until about 312 AD, imagine this. Christian persecution everywhere. Beatings, people getting crucified upside down, people being burned alive, boiled in water, people that were killed simply because they professed Christ. That was the reality that most Christians had to live in the first, second, third, fourth century. That was the reality that they had to face. As we learned from Julie's talk last night, Constantine kind of changed things a little bit. He kind of turned the tides a little bit as far as the way that the world received Christianity. And after a while, that became kind of the norm. The norm became Christianity. That was now a good thing because you no longer got persecuted because that was what you, your entire nation and your entire empire believed was Christianity. So you actually had some protection. You were no longer persecuted. Fast forward a lot more years now to the Church of England, kind of after the Reformation. England wanted to begin to send people to this new area to colonize America. And then what they did was they sent the Puritans, or what we call the Puritans, the pilgrims. And they came over and they began to say, let's create a nation, knit, together with God's design from the ground up. We want to basically do church life 
but make it everything. Everything God's design. All the people, all Christians, all the time. Everywhere you went. You went to the store, all Christians. You went downtown to do something, all Christians. Christians everywhere. That was their design. They had a desire for a holy nation. Now, your book actually says that this was destined to fail from the start. <laughs> because it's almost impossible to be able to say we want to create a community that is 100% Christian from the ground up. And we'll talk more about why that was not necessarily a great idea. One of the things that they really desired that was really, really good was they wanted to have one nation, one language, one religion, and one set of doctrines that kind of were America. That's what they wanted. The problem that they ran into in 1646, and this will be number two, is that on the Hudson River, 18 different languages were spoken in New York. 18 different languages in 1646 in America. You know how hard it is to be able to do the church the exact same way when you have 18 different languages proclaiming the gospel in 18 different ways? It's really hard to also keep your doctrine straight too when you have people coming from different backgrounds with different faith traditions too. It becomes really, really, really difficult to try to unify everybody when everyone's proclaiming something a little bit different. And so what they had to do is they kind of had to settle for this idea basically of being able to give religious liberty to those who are around. They said, okay, well, since we can't control necessarily this area or that area, what they're preaching or what they're saying, we're just going to have to kind of let everybody do their own thing. But it wasn't just letting them do their own thing because they still had one thing in common. They still had Jesus in common. And that was the one unifying factor they were able to point to. They said, you may preach something different. You may speak a different language. But there's still one unifying factor. It's Jesus. Jesus is still most important. But not only that, number three, the need for experiential grace. One of the things that was a characteristic of the church before this time was church attendance equated salvation. Now, no one would have said that explicitly that you attend church and therefore you have salvation, but they realized that they couldn't just continue to live their lives in the church. The clergy were saying like, if you just come to church, if you're a part of this, if you're just a member, you have salvation. Sure, we'll forgive all your sins. Everything will be fine. And the Puritans recognized something. They said, that doesn't quite seem to line up with scripture. They said something's wrong, and I think that the, your book actually does an awesome job of being able to outline this. So this is one of the quotes that, um, uh, that Bruce has on page 363. He says this, This new light or inward witness come to the confession of Jesus Christ was the key to the revival in New England. The revivalists pointed out that their fathers had left the Church of England to come to America precisely because they believed it was contrary to the Word of God to permit the unconverted to enter into church <laughs> membership and salvation. The awakening they felt was a call from God to begin a new reformation in New England. So what's he saying, basically? He's saying, basically, that the Church of England looked at your church attendance as salvation. And they said, that's not true, because you need to have some sort of an experience with grace. You need to be able to let the gospel impact you to be able to be a part of this. Otherwise, salvation is just nothing more than mechanistic. It's just you do something, and then you get salvation. And they said, that's not correct. That's not true. And so they came and desired to start a nation where they said, no, experiential grace. That's going to be where we're going to be. That's how we're going to do it. So let's talk about some of the what actually happened. So what actually did happen? Well, God saved hundreds of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people. And I don't think your book actually gives a number on that or not. And I couldn't find a number of like how many people got saved during the Great Awakening. It's like I wanted to find a number because I was like, I just need a number. Tell me how many. I couldn't find one. And they gave some statistics about church attendance increasing from like 60% of America to 80% of America. They didn't really tell me what the demographics were of who that included or didn't include. But I think that the biggest thing I took away from this was there was an inward witness. People were actually beginning to think about the gospel for the first time. Because for much of their lives, all they knew was basically walking into church, sitting down, listening to a service equated them being right with God. For the very first time, preachers were finally saying, you have actually offended and sinned against your God. And he is a holy, just God. Salvation is only possible through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so they sat and they went, whoa, that's nothing I've ever heard of. In fact, there was actually sobbing, gasping, and I actually read an, another, uh, another book that actually said that people were fainting at some points when these preachers were talking about how, like, how great their sin was. Like, just for, imagine that for a second. Cor gets up on a Sunday morning. Morning. <laughs> My name's Cor. Morning. My name's Cor. I'm on the pastoral staff here. Today we're going to talk about sin. And just people just start fainting all over the place. Like, that would be insane. But that's what people did. Because, here's the thing. They weren't preaching an extraordinary gospel. They weren't preaching anything that's different from what we hear on a Sunday or what you're hearing now. It was just the gospel. And for them, it was fresh. It was new. They had never heard it before. 
Or maybe they had heard it, they just never really thought about it. And for the first time, they were open to this idea. But they needed to have a relationship with God. I actually read um, an account of an unnamed um, person who wrote this in their journal. This is their entrance kind of after their conversion story at church. They write, it was ecstasy for my weary soul. Jesus, oh, the sweet love of my Jesus. My Savior has called me to repent and live. There was weeping for hours, yes, but I never did return to my life of transgression. It wasn't, extraordinary. It wasn't an extraordinary gospel. It was just the gospel, but it impacted them in a way that they had never heard before. It stirred an entire community towards all kinds of, of things. So who are the catalysts of this? What, what, who did this? Was it just pastors in the towns? Was it some of the other people that were coming in? Was it missionaries? Who was it? Three people that kind of kicked this all off were George Whitfield, John Wesley, and Jonathan Edwards. How many of you have heard of Jonathan Edwards before? John Wesley, George Whitfield, most of you. Okay, so you kind of you have a framework of who these people are. But there's something really unique about the way that they did their ministry. They realized that they could only reach a certain amount of people when they preached inside their churches. So, if you have a building problem, but you don't really have the resources to go and build a building, what do you do if you want to reach more people? Well, multi-site? I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't think they could beam a message. What, what else? What were some other options? Go outside. Yeah, they went outside. They started preaching outdoors. So they would kind of build these kind of makeshift stages, and they'd get up and preach to thousands of people. But here's the crazy thing. It wasn't just Christians that came and listened to them. It was basically entire towns, entire communities. So even non-Christians were showing up and hearing this. And for the first time, they had such great communication skills that people were repenting like crazy. They're like, oh my gosh, the gospel, it's a real thing. I've sinned against a holy God, but he's redeemed me. I want that. It was unique in that. But it wasn't just unique about that. It wasn't just the outdoor preaching. It wasn't that they had good communication skills. It wasn't that they traveled around to different areas preaching a gospel. They realized this. So I'm against, the, I'm against the idea of this kind of traveling preaching. I was like, eh, I don't like that. I don't like that. It focuses a lot on the conversion, but what about discipleship? What about the hard work? What about the work that kind of gets you to have a lifelong relationship with Jesus? Well, they thought about that. And so one of the things that Wesley did is he actually get, gathered about six to eight people at a time and said, you people are going to get together and you're going to read the word. You're going to confess sin. You're going to do life with one another. You're going to cook meals with each other. And you're just going to basically do everything together. What does that sound a lot like, I hope? Sounds a lot like small groups, right? Yeah, for them, they called them experience meetings. I like that. That sounds sweet. It sounds really trendy. Yeah, rebranding opportunity for small groups, maybe. But this idea of experience meetings, they actually began to do life together because they, they decided that like, th this isn't just a one-time thing. Conversion is just a, like a boom and then we're done. It's a constant, everyday kind of thing. And so they would meet for days and days and days on end doing life together. Some of them even signed covenants with each other. They signed covenants and said, till death do we part. They weren't married. It was just like, we're just going to do this until we die. We're going to continue to walk together. We're not giving up on each other. We're going to see that we finish the race strong. It was completely transformational in the way that they did ministry. So, it could seem like everything was really awesome. It's like, oh man, let's just go back then. That sounds awesome. Let's adopt experience meetings. We'll get Steve to preach outside of the parks. It'll be awesome. It's like, well, sort of. I want to save us from saying those kinds of things. Um, but here's some pitfalls. Here's some of the things that your book did and did not talk about about the Great Awakenings that happened. The first one is perfection over grace. So I mentioned at first how the Puritans wanted to create this kind of holy nation. They wanted to create something that was very centralized. They wanted the church and the government to basically one and the same. They wanted everything to be perfect. The problem is, is that when you start wanting things to be exactly as God designed them, you start running into issues that you, of idolatry. Specifically, idolizing perfection over grace. Because they wanted things to look exactly like God had wanted it to look like, they ran into these issues. They started excommunicating people. They started pushing people out of their communities and basically abandoning them if they didn't live up to the standards and rules that they had set. And what do you do when sin begins to run rampant? You just make more rules and more laws. And it starts to choke out the life of these communities, which to the point where before kind of the Great Awakenings happened, some of these churches were in communities had gone from thousands to only a couple 50, 60 people because they valued perfection over grace, which is a problem, because we know that's not the gospel. The second one is a power complex. Um, only free men and property owners were allowed to vote or be in leadership. This is a problem because this is also not the gospel. Denying somebody the opportunity to be in leadership simply because of the color of their skin or their gender is antithetical to the gospel. 
and it needs to be said, and it needs to be said loud, because that's true. That is a problem. And your book doesn't talk about it, and neither does the other two church history books that I read, but this was a reality that they had to face. The third one, splits. Congregations began to split. Again, if you have a bunch of different languages and you have a bunch of different people preaching different things, doctrines are going to look a little bit differently. The problem was is that it became preferential, not spiritual. Some people liked doing baptism this way. Some people like worship that way. Some people like doing their experiences meetings this way versus that way. And they began to look at that and say, well, it looks like you're not doing it as spiritual as we are. We're going to go do our own thing. And eventually you got an entire generation that became unchurched because thousands of denominations began to rise out of this. Thousands upon thousands of denominations began to split off from some of these main denominations that came over to America. And so you got splits and splits, and then people that said, I'm done with the church. There's too many denominations. I don't know which, what, which one is right, which one's wrong. I don't know which one to be part of. So some pitfalls to that. So some of the ways that the Great Awakening actually changes our ministry today. So what are some of the consequences or some of the things that are still present today? What do we still see? Well, this. Um, this individualized faith, this new light, was recognized as key for membership and reconciliation with God. That's something that we still believe today. It's something that we still do today. We still believe that the way that you are saved is through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We still believe that. It's in our faith, statement of faith. It's what Martin Luther preached. And we still believe that. That's still a thing that's active today. You have the opportunity to be able to have a relationship with Jesus and have salvation. The second one, pietism, for better or for worse here, um, because the Great Awakenings focus so much on this kind of get saved, read your Bible, pray, do life together, was really, really great. But then there became a lack of emphasis on community church life and service to the city. Really, 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 really good with the, and pietism is just basically like kind of the holy lifestyle, if you want to kind of frame it that way, of we're reading, we're praying, we're together, everything is awesome. But that kind of took a precedent over serving the city. It took a precedent of engaging with culture. It took a precedent over some of these other elements that were key to seeing the gospel continue to go forward and not become inward focused, but outward focused. So better for worse, pietism ended up becoming a part of our culture even today. And then the last one, church and state. One of the things that's really difficult is to try to unite a church under all different churches when they don't all believe the same things, which basically they started advocating for religious liberty. And they said basically, all right, you know what? We're not going to have a government then that tries to impose their rules and regulations upon the different religions. We're going to fight for religious liberty, which is still a part of our nation today. Again, for better or for worse, adds for a lot of conversation about how we see the church and the government interacting. Regardless of that, it's still something that we see today. It's still something that is a part of our nation. So here's how I want to end in the remaining moments that I have with you guys. Um, I want us to get lost in God's story. So all this can seem like, great, lots of facts, really good things that we need to know. So how does this all matter? This is how it matters. Um, the Great Awakening, again, like I said, was not something that just kind of happened at one point in history and then it kind of died out. It was actually a part of a grander story. So I want to walk through really briefly, really quickly, kind of God's story and how the Great Awakening actually continued to move, not just in the 1800s, the 1700s, and 1600s, but continue to go forward. So we start back in the garden with Adam and Eve. I don't, know, I don't know what Adam's showing her, but she does not look that impressed. I don't know what it is. We go from the garden to Abraham. God says, I will bless you. I will make your nation abundant. I will make your name great. And your descendants will be as numerous as the stars. God has a plan. Moses. Israel, you are my people. I will lead you to freedom. You will be my son. You will be my people. And you will resent me to the ends of the earth. David, you will be a great king, and after you will come one even greater, a better and truer king, one that will rule in justice and peace. We get to Jesus, the fulfillment of it all. When Jesus dies on a Roman cross, takes our shame and sin and guilt, and liberates us from the bondage to death, then you get the apostles who continue to preach and preach the gospel. In Acts 18, the gospel finally is no longer centralized over Jerusalem, but has continued to reach Samaria and even farther into the Greek regions. Gentiles are now accepted, and they gave glory to God when they found out that the Gentiles had been accepted into this covenant as well, not just the Jews. The gospel continues to go farther. We get to what I talked about earlier about martyrdom, Christians being persecuted like crazy, but the church flourished, even though there was persecutions. 
And these were these persecutions actually grew so much that the church actually flourished in this time. The church grew and grew and grew. More people heard the gospel. The gospel went so far as even this. In I didn't, I don't know how I got this or where I got this from, but I have in my notes that there was an unorganized effort of an unnamed missionary that had taken the gospel from some time or somewhere in Jerusalem after the death of Christ and somehow had made it all the way to England and delivered the gospel in the first century. We don't have dates, we don't have times, but we do know that there was an unorganized effort from unorganized missionaries that brought the gospel that far in the first century. So the gospel continues to spread and spread and spread and spread all across Europe. Next we get to Luther, who proclaims that, no, the gospel is not this, but this, and says, I'm going to nail these 99, 99 theses to this door and make a statement to the world that says, this is the way that God saves people. This is the way that God is supposed to be viewed, 1517. Then we get to what I just talked about, the Great Awakenings. In 1612, the King James Version was finally released, which means that now there's an English version that everybody can read, which is the most widely read version of the Bible in all of history. Then in 1647, the very first church in America was established, Jamestown Church in Jamestown, Virginia, the very first church in America. But it doesn't stop. We get to our great awakenings. Hundreds of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people come to faith. But it doesn't stop there. Again, this is where things get interesting. In the early 1800s, the echo of the great awakenings continued, and hundreds of men and women felt the conviction to, uh, and the woo of God and motivated them to want to share the gospel with all the new settlements that were happening on the other side of the 13 colonies because there were more settlements that were happening on the other side, in the West. In 1934, right, so only 50, 60 years after the Great Awakening, right? In 1934, the very first missionaries land in Fort Snelling, Minnesota, and begin to preach the gospel to the surrounding settlements here. In 1847, this woman, Harriet Bishop, moved from Vermont to Minnesota to St. Paul and started a Sunday school class in a blacksmith shop in St. Paul, Minnesota with seven people. Only two of them spoke English. Two years later, Reverend John Parsons and Harriet Bishop began to work together to begin a church to reach St. Paul. Reverend John Parsons went to the East to raise money, but was beaten, robbed, and died before he returned. Then this guy, it looks like he's just a fiery preacher, T.R. Cressy and his friend Andrew Torbett came and began ministering to the congregation immediately after Reverend John Parsons' death, along with Harriet, and established this church. Anybody know what church that is? It's First Baptist Church, St. Paul, where we gather for our lower town services. In 1853, T.R.'s brother E.W. Cressy then went along with members of First Baptist St. Paul and came to start this church. Anyone know just what this church is? First Baptist Minneapolis. First Baptist Minneapolis. 50 years, or no, 20 years after that, 22 Swedish immigrant believers who were attending First Baptist Church Minneapolis asked for permission from the elders to break and begin a new church. The elders agreed, and on June 22, 1871, the first Swedish Baptist Church of Minneapolis was formed and then would be renamed Bethlehem Baptist Church. And then finally, in 1996, an apprentice under John Piper at Bethlehem Baptist Church named Stephen Treichler has a vision and passion for ministering to college students and plants a church out of Bethlehem Baptist called Hope Community Church. <coughs> and now we have these two spaces to worship in. That's the history of the gospel from the Great Awakenings until now, but we started from Genesis. God has a story. And here's the thing. We didn't even talk about the history of the buildings that we were in. That's just simply how the path of the gospel got to Steve to plant hope. That's not the history of the two buildings. We could do a full history on the buildings that we meet in, the East and West buildings. We could do that. But that's the story. That's the story that we have. The gospel continued to move and continued to spread to the point where now we are sitting here because of the things that happened. The things I mentioned, that's... That's God's design. God's design was to have that. So, why, whoop, no, not that. Why does this matter? I want to push this. I want to push this and it matters because God isn't done moving. Clearly, as we see, God is still not done moving. God done, isn't done breathing life into people. He's not done starting new congregations. He's not done starting new church plants. But more than that, God is bringing people to himself from darkness to light. And this tells me, this is the personal application, and I'll have kind of a, a discussion question for everybody. This tells me that God does not regret saving you. Whether or not you came to faith through hope or not, God doesn't regret saving you because this is a part of his plan. The fact that you have faith and that you're meeting with us right now 
at hope tells me God's not done and he doesn't regret saving you. And I think this is important. I think that we need to reflect on this because we're lost in God's story and we're all a part of that story. Somehow, some way, someone shared the gospel with you. Somehow you came to faith. Somehow you got to know Jesus. And God doesn't regret that. God is very pleased that you know him. God is very <laughs> pleased that you're here. So we can have this. We know that God is committed to his story and we're a part of that story. God has orchestrated the gospel renewal or revival as a way to show his faithfulness and love to us. But even amidst the brokenness of the world, it's really key that we can have hope that God can and will continue to breathe gospel renewal into communities, which then leads me to the application questions that are not on your sheet because I came up with them literally only a few days ago. Do we see the Great Awakenings and the gospel revivals as something that could or needs to happen today? Do we feel the need for a gospel renewal at Hope Community Church?